Welcome to the PFF UI podcast. On this month's episode, Indianapolis Fire Department Coordinator of Firefighter Wellness and Support, Brennan Dryman, joins the program to discuss firefighter mental health and wellness. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to the PFF UI podcast. My name is Eric Schoeb and I'm joined today by President Tony Murray. Hey Tony, how's it going today? It's going pretty good. Um, Eric, it's good to see you. Good to be back. Great. Yeah. Uh, we are in full swing in holiday mode. We are in that odd time between Thanksgiving and uh, the December holidays. So we're always just running around and Going from meeting to meet. State of fullness of a variety of things, just full. Absolutely. We're joined today by Indianapolis Fire Department Coordinator of Firefighter Wellness and Support, Brandon Dryman. Hey, Brandon, how's it going today? Things are going very well. Thank you. Battled the rain and the the mix to get here, but I got here late. So thank you for having me. It is mixing today. Yeah, it's a very much of a wintry mix here. So, okay, Brandon, so why don't you tell us a bit about yourself and your background? Yeah. So, uh, as I mentioned, or as you mentioned, I'm with the Indianapolis Fire Department. I've been uh, here in Indianapolis for 22 years now. I started out in the fire service when I was actually 16 years old, though. I started as a volunteer with the Vincent's Township Fire Department, went to EMT school when I was in college down there, worked private ambulance. Uh, so I got involved in this very young and uh, practiced law for a little while. That's part of my history down in Evansville. I was a deputy prosecutor down there and uh, their headquarters was like two buildings down from where I practice law and ev- all day long I watched their rescue, their engine driving by on emergencies and it just drove me crazy that I wasn't doing what I knew I wanted to do. Grew up on Johnny and Roy and had always wanted to be a firefighter so I left uh, practicing law, joined uh, Washington Township up here and then we ended up merging in um, I think four to six years after that. I uh, went to paramedic school and uh about seven years ago, I left the companies to move into the administration as the coordinator of wellness and support. And that started out as our, our peer support program, and it's it's grown quite a bit since then into a lot of other programming. We've been very fortunate with Chief Malone to support the types of efforts that we want to do with, with wellness and IFD, as well as Local 416, the things that we've done there. Local 416 has done a great job of making sure that all of our members have access to that type of programming, so we have a really good partnership there. Were you the first? person that to uh, fill that position within IFD? I was the first coordinator. Um, chief Doug Abernathy uh, was the first chief of wellness and support. And I just found out that he was just getting overwhelmed. There was just too much work for one person. So then they brought me in Sure, uh, about six months after he went into the office. Okay. Um, so, and then I, I also, I work uh, for the IFF as part of their uh, peer support training cadre, as well as their resilience program. And I'm on their crisis response team, primarily for firefighter suicides. A firefighter will die by suicide and a local may not have the resources in place for peer support or know what they need. So the IFF will muster a team and we'll have boots on the ground, usually within 24 hours to start figuring out what to do next and help those, those agencies through that suicide. So that's kind of the broad, broad brush of why I'm here and, and what I've been doing the last uh, couple decades. And I know that you have, uh, we, we keep in contact, um, you know, as uh, since uh, I've filled, been in this position as a, the president for 17 months now, we've had a lot of conversations about, you know, the work that you do, maybe some gaps that we need, that we recognize that we need to, to try to help our locals across the state fill. Um, and, uh, you know, through your role as uh, both here in Indianapolis, but for the IAFF, uh, I see you at a bunch of conferences and <laughs> IFF uh, workshops and, and presenting things. And we've had you uh, uh, present to our PFFUI membership over the uh, course of the last few years as well. And any number of things. So we, I, I really appreciate you being here today, Brian. Thank you. Have the opportunity to have a conversation with you. So kind of moving into, uh, Sort of, you know, you, you have a, and I'm glad that you moved out of uh, being an attorney because I think that you're, you're, I didn't know you as an attorney, but I think you're very well suited for uh, the fire service 
uh, for sure. Uh, and probably a, it's good to, that you went and chased that rescue truck going down the street, figure out how you... <laughs> it worked out, right? Yeah. So how did how did you get involved um, in from the standpoint of, of uh, firefighter wellness and, and support? How did that all begin? Well, I guess if you think back, the old hair club uh, president, you know, I'm, I'm also a client sort of thing. That's how I got involved in, in behavioral health is um, uh, throughout my life, uh, even, even when I was practicing law, I drank too much and it just got worse and worse and worse. It was, as, as we say, a chronic and progressive disease. And that was the case for me and my drinking got uh, out of control. I ended up getting pulled for a random breath test. Um, and tested positive whenever I came in for work for alcohol. I had had a pretty long night the night before. I thought that I was going to be fine, but I wasn't, and I blew positive. And fortunately, uh, IFD had uh, a second chance policy, so I went to our EAP, took my suspension, but went to EAP, got sober. And as part of that sobriety, I knew that I wanted to give back. I knew I wasn't the only person on the job that had an alcohol problem. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's how I got involved originally with CISM, and then our CISM program. Uh, developed into peer support when the IFF uh, launched that model. And Dr. Bob Smith, who is our clinical director at Local 416, uh, also helped the IFF build that program. So I was able to get involved through Dr. Bob. And through teaching that and uh, wanting to get more involved with CISM here, and then we we turned into the peer support, um, saw the opportunity to move into the office. And I think that Chief Malone recognized my dedication and how seriously I took this. Uh, because I had that lived experience. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of how I got involved in all of it was just, um, I knew there was a need. I knew people could get better. Recovery is possible. I always tell people that, that recovery is possible. I'm living proof. I had a severe alcohol use disorder. Um, and that was 11 years ago. I got sober and haven't looked back and it's, there's so much hope. And that's what I hope people take away from this is that people get better all the time. You just have to have that moment where you recognize it's costing you a lot more than it's giving you and then reaching out for the help that you need. And there are people like me and people probably within every agency in North America who are willing to help somebody through that. And that's what we really try and accomplish is whether it's addiction or mental health, whatever it may be, to, to make sure people get that help. And that's really important. And especially for our, our membership, you know, you, you said that it, uh, you never look back, but what you've done by my assessment is you have dedicated yourself to giving back uh, through the work that you're doing uh, for our members, uh, not just here in Indiana, but but really all across the country as you've been involved with the IFF and, and the programming there. But you've had to probably get some credentialing, I would say, um, to do the work that you do. What, what type of credentialing uh, have you worked on uh, to fill this role? The one that is fairly accessible to anyone who's a member of um, a local is the IFF peer support training. Yeah. I've had that. So getting that, that two day life skills class, uh, is one of the credentials I have. Um, and again, I, I think it's important. It's probably the most successful program the IFF's ever launched with over 10,000 people trained, wow. um, in the peer support model. So that's one thing, um, outside of, um, fire service through the state of Indiana, I'm a certified addiction peer recovery coach. Um, and there's two levels to that. I'm level two, which just means that I have more clinical hours. Uh, so uh, that's an annual certification. I also have a mental health endorsement as part of that, which just means that I get some extra mental health education. Um, and, and what that certification allows me to do is when someone is seeking out treatment to help them navigate that. What are your roadblocks going to be? How can we remove those roadblocks? What does the different treatment modes look like to, to kind of help people navigate that? When they get back from treatment, also having some accountability because we know things can break down when somebody gets back from treatment. So we help with that. I'm also a, a certified community health worker and certified recovery specialist uh, with the substance abuse endorsement through the state of Indiana. It's a very, very similar to a recovery coach certification. It's just two different organizations that do that. They've since merged, so that will probably become one certification eventually. Um, in addition to that, uh, I'm a certified yoga teacher. That was something that we did through uh, IFD. A couple of us uh, went to City Yoga here in Indianapolis and became yoga teachers. Um, so I have that certification as well as yoga for 12-step recovery certification to lead classes that combine the tradition and history of yoga with 12-step recovery modeling. Um, so I'm certified to do that. And then I guess the other thing would be a certified behavioral um, 
I'm sorry, um, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia clinician. Uh, once we saw that sleep was a big issue that we needed to address in the fire service, um, I got that done, as did Tim Gallagher with Local 416. He also went through that training so that we can, again, make sure that all the members within Local 416 have access to that type of programming. Yeah, which is an awesome segue. Yeah, Brandon just really teed it up there for us. This is fantastic. Yeah. Whenever I go to the doctor, they always ask me, what is my average night of sleep? And whenever I say it's not very much, they become very concerned. But then I tell them that I'm a firefighter and then they go, oh, well, I guess that makes sense. But we're also learning that sleep plays a large part in firefighter mental wellness. Expand on that for us. Yeah, in more than one way, um, it's relevant. I mean, there's there is some, I think, sleep element either explicitly or implicitly in every mental health diagnosis. Like, no mental health problem gets better with less sleep. That's just kind of the way it is. Um, the brain doesn't function as well. The chemistry of the brain uh, gets off whenever you're not getting enough rest. From a more direct diagnosis perspective, um, something like PTSD is directly tied back to the types of sleep you're getting. So when you go to sleep, we've probably all heard of deep sleep, and we've probably all heard of REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. The traumatic events that we face on this job and, and in life, but more often so on the job, those life-threatening situations, those all get processed during REM sleep. Um, and very, and most of our REM sleep is actually loaded into the back half of the night. Uh, if we're not getting enough sleep, if we're not in particular getting enough REM sleep, our brain can't process that trauma appropriately. And there's there's a part of that called extinction recall, which is where your brain will review a traumatic event, and the last step in the process is your brain will say, I'm safe. When your brain says, I'm safe, that's what extinction recall is. That only happens during REM sleep. So if you're not getting enough sleep, there's a good chance, well, that increases the likelihood that you will develop post-traumatic stress disorder. Because you're really sort of never putting that to rest, yep. so to speak, that yeah. you're always sort of dealing with those those thoughts exactly consciously or unconsciously yeah if you think about uh, our brain is almost like a filing system and when that event gets processed it gets put in the file and the door gets shut um but when it's not processed appropriately through sleep either the corner of the page stays sticking out so when you shut the drawer it's like kind of hanging out a little bit or it never makes it to the drawer at all yeah uh, and that's all all tied back to sleep and when you look at particularly things like caffeine usage, which seems pretty benign. And overall, it's, you know, it's, it's not a big deal. But when you're drinking coffee until right before you go to bed, you may sleep, but your brain waves are going to be really active because coffee's a stimulant. Yeah. I think you um, once told me, gave me some advice, like, you have your last cup of coffee at what time? It's like 10 a.m. ideally. Yeah. And yeah. that's just not going to work for me. No. Right? It's, it doesn't work for a lot of people. possible. It sounds crazy. Uh, anyway. But that, so that can affect your deep sleep. The other issue we face as we look at um, mental health issues is alcohol. Um, all of us here know that alcohol is a problem in the fire service. Um, when you are drunk and you try and sleep, even if you're not drunk, if you're, if you're just under the influence, so to speak, that slows your brain down. It's a depressant, central nervous system depressant. So that actually prevents your brain from getting into REM sleep to begin with. So in the days after a traumatic event, because those events can be processed for quite a while before they're finally filed away, for a lot of firefighters, the drug that they use to help themselves sleep and to help them relax actually prevents them from getting the REM sleep they need to process trauma, which again increases the likelihood that they can develop PTSD. So, you know, any anything across the board, I think mental health wise can be tied back to sleep, but the best concrete example I can give of how that kind of ties in is with PTSD and, and the risk we put ourselves with, you know, getting up too early and, and using alcohol to self-medicate or other depressants like THC. Mm -hmm. has the same effect. Well, so if I could unpack what you just said here so, and kind of put this into perspective. So by the very nature of our work, um, you know, firefighters, EMTs, paramedics, 911 dispatchers, our members are subjecting themselves or having those experiences of trauma, high stress environments. We work in a, a shift work model where we have constant interrupted sleep patterns uh, we tend to use too many stimulants like caffeine, and then to wrap it all into a ball, we 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 try to you know we utilize uh, alcohol probably more than um, the average person. I'm just saying I don't know. I'm just guessing, uh, it, which is part of our social engagement, right? And yeah. this work, 
So all of that, <laughs> you're saying, you know, uh, really kind of creates a, a, a situation of the, 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 the worst case scenario storm, like, you know, yeah. to try to deal with some of these things that going back to the nature of the work. Yeah, um, yeah that's a, a fair assessment. And, and you talk about, you're guessing that we use alcohol at rates higher than the general population. I can give you a, a comparison from, some, from a study. When it comes to alcohol use disorder in particular, the general population suffers from that at a rate of about 6% the fire service is at least 30%. So one in three firefighters has some level of alcohol use disorder. It's a 500% increase versus a general population. So so your hunch was correct, sir. <laughs> and and really the, the, the other piece is that it's not a secret that um, like this this line of work is not great for sleep. And, and, and I hear you say like in order to deal with these things, you have to actually get proper sleep. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it can take some work, but it, the good news is there are a lot of things we can do to improve our sleep hygiene, and you don't have to do them all at once. That's the beauty of it. You can try one thing for a few weeks and see how it goes, and that's what we do with cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia and sleep coaching is we talk to the firefighter about all those different aspects of their, their sleep patterns and, and how they're trying to improve it, the things they're doing to derail it. Uh, do they have other behavioral health problems that are impacting their sleep, and can we deal with those first? So it's it's a real total picture of what we need to do to improve that sleep, but we can chip away at it in really effective ways to help our members because um, a lot of it is self-sabotage, just staying up too late when you're on duty. Sure. You know you're tired and just staying up anyway. I mean, that's problematic. That hurts us. And in the long run, that can kill us because of the impact it has uh, on our cancer risk and our our addiction risk and all those things. Yeah. And I, I remember kind of as a, as a younger person get involved in this work, um, I, I, it wasn't uncommon, like to not be able to go to sleep at, at the station, um, just for, because you thought you're going to miss something, yeah. you know, or that, you know, you just, or I don't know, maybe it was a, that I just couldn't, I couldn't actually relax, you know, enough. And, and then when you do get in bed, you know, you're sort of, at least for me, for a number of years, you were anticipating getting woke up, Yeah. So, um, you know, that sort of, you know, that prevented me from actually getting good rest, but. You know, if somebody's, you know, if somebody's listening to this right now, is, is there anything that you can pay attention to or, or take action um, to help with sleep if they're at, you know, the fire station or, or on their days off? Or is there anything, any good advice? Yeah, I think just some, a few very low-hanging fruit things I would say is a cheap pair of earplugs like you would get from big box store, get a jug of those, um, and don't get expensive ones, get cheap ones. And I say cheap because a cheap earplug will block enough of the background noise that will keep you from waking up at the firehouse when somebody's phone buzzes or they get up to go to the bathroom, but they're not so good that you won't hear the tones drop. Mm -hmm. So it's a good, safe way to block out some of that noise. Use them at work, use them at home. Um, going to bed at the same time every night, on duty, off duty is important. And there may be things that, that happen at work, obviously, that you can't control. Somebody has to be up at night. That's that's the rub with all this is somebody has to take the call at 2 in the morning. We can't say, sorry, I'm sleeping. So what are we doing off duty? So going to bed, getting up at the same time every day. Um, naps are great, but make sure that if you take a nap, it's 45 minutes or less before 4 p.m. Uh, that can really help you out. So there's a lot of little things we can be doing uh, to improve our sleep that don't require drastic changes and don't require a big investment. So just to reiterate, too, for those management that or, or you know, uh, fire command that are listening, you should, I hear you say you should take a nap. Absolutely. During the day on a 24-hour shift. Yeah. And, and we're designed, in the afternoon, our core temperature will drop a half a degree to a full degree after lunch. And everything in basically everything in the mammal kingdom, that happens. And we're designed actually to take a nap after lunch. Other cultures have siesta and things like that for a reason. Yeah. Um, and we don't in the West because taking naps is viewed as non-productive and we yeah. need to always be producing. Yeah. In reality, that nap makes you more productive. Um, if you've been up for 18 hours, most people will start to function as if they have a BAC blood alcohol content of about 0 0.08. So fine motor skills start to go, reflex times drop, critical decision-making isn't as good. Management should want their people to take naps. Yeah. Um, it shouldn't be a fight. Uh, okay. Because it does make them safer, more effective employees if they can have an, a nap after lunch. You heard it from the expert. There it is, folks. Yeah, and and you know it, it's a scary thing to actually think about, but I, I think that everybody 
who has uh, done this job for any amount of time has had that experience of driving home in the morning and sort of uh, probably falling asleep a little bit. Yeah. And, and just kind of, and it's happened to me. It's scary. It's scary. It, you know, it, it kind of gets, it makes, it makes me nervous. Yeah. You know, well, I think if, quickly. you know, if we look at law enforcement as a comparison, police officers don't normally get killed in shootouts and stabbings and things like that. They get killed driving in their cars. Mm -hmm. um, and I know the sheriff's departments, we've lost deputies who've fallen asleep at the wheel, mm -hmm. working third shifts, things like that. So that is a real risk is being fatigued driving the, the cost to our agencies just in vehicle accidents and how much of that is due to slowed reflex and reaction times because people are fatigued is a real that's a real level of inquiry we need to have, I think. Yeah. And anything else that I know we were, you were talking about some, some tips, any other tips that for sleep hygiene? You know, I watch, I'm not a huge fan of supplements, figuring out if you're taking a supplement, why am I taking it? And how can I correct that more naturally? Um, the naps I mentioned, um, a hot shower two hours before bed, um, can be really useful to basically make your core temperature drop, it can trick your brain into thinking it's time to go to sleep. Turning off your device an hour before bed, um, blocking that blue light somehow coming from your device, whether it's turning it off or putting it on night shift mode, all those things help because your device puts off blue light just like the sun and your brain can't tell the difference between the two. So if you're just turning your device off at midnight, that your brain just figured out that it's nighttime. Wow. So um, again, little things we can do. What what about just um, if if you could what what do you think about the um, the white noise and stuff? I, there's apps and different mm -hmm. things that, and I've tried this myself. What is there anything to that? There is. Um, if nothing else, it blocks out again some of that low level noise that might otherwise wake you up. We've probably, I mean, if you've ever had the experience of being in a room and it's too quiet to sleep, like yeah. I've certainly oh, yeah. had that experience where it's just so quiet I can't sleep. Those those noises are really good for that. And you can, I have a free app on my phone. I can't remember the name of it, like white market or something like that, but it's, it has hundreds of different sounds uh, and okay. you can find something that works for you. Theoretically, pink noise has been tied to better deep sleep, but I think any of those noises and even something as simple as just having a fan running in your room. I know most firefighters, I think, use a fan. That has two benefits. One, it, it has the background noise that can help lull you to sleep like we're talking about. And it can also cool your room down. Your core temperature needs to drop about two degrees to enter deep sleep. So uh, right at the outset, in particular, when you lay down, that first phase of deep sleep is critical. Um, so cool and, and try to make that uh, the guy snoring next to you seem a little more soothing. <laughs> um, so I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the topic of uh, resilience. Mm -hmm. And what that means, I, I know that you just recently um, conducted a an IFF delivery of of resiliency up in Hamilton County for local forty four sixteen in Fishers. Um, can you talk a little bit about resiliency and, and what that is and what it means? Why is it and why is it important? Yeah, so kind of at, at the bottom level, resilience just describes your ability to to bend and not break in the face of life's challenges. That's probably as simply as I could put it. Um, we think of the, there's an old saying about in the face of the storm, the oak tree broke, but the willow bent and survived that sort of thing. That's a very poor requoting of a very good uh, adage, but that's my, my shot at that. But that's really what we're talking about. How do you weather that storm without breaking? And it has to, it's a big shift from a reactive mindset to a proactive mindset. Um, there's uh, again, to throw another adage out there, there's this idea of we've gotten really good at pulling people out of the river but we have to start figuring out why they're falling in. And that's what resi resilience looks at, the why are people falling into the river in the first place. So we've built great peer support systems throughout the United States and Canada. We have tremendous resources available for when things go wrong. That's great. We're always going to have to have that. People are always going to get sick and, and hurt and have mental health conditions, so we have to have those resources in place. But just like we figured out, hey, lifting weights, cardiovascular fitness, all these things help prevent injuries, uh, resilience are the practices that we can engage in to help prevent those psychological problems that we know can happen um, if people don't take care of themselves proactively. So that's that's really the big shift is reactive to a proactive mindset. That's really well put, I yeah. think, and, and that makes sense to me. Um, you know, when we talk about peer support or wellness and, 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 and support for one another, um, you know, 
what's the role of the union in in your view uh, on these topics? I think within a lot of agencies, whether there's trust within the administration and the firefighter or not, we look to our our labor group as our safe place, as the group we know has our back and is going to protect our interests. So I think there is a role there in normalizing this discussion through your local local leadership to say, it's okay if you have an alcohol problem, we can get you help for that um, and are going to do everything we can to make sure you're not penalized as a result of wanting to get help. Um, so the union plays a huge role in, in creating that climate where people feel safe asking for that help. Right. Because and, it's not necessarily a consequence-based yeah. you know, view. Yeah, right. and it shouldn't be. We look at the Wellness Fitness Initiative and the way that it was rolled out basically so people could get healthier without punitive um, action taken against them. We want to have the same culture for mental health. Mm-hmm. Is how can people reach out for help and not be penalized as a result? Um and I think the union is a, a real driving force in that. And with that comes a responsibility on the part of, of affiliate leadership and, and whoever is at, you know, in charge of these programs to make sure that those resources are available, that they're accessible, that they've been vetted. They're not just picked off psychology today and written down as a resource. Somebody's actually walked into that office and vetted that clinician so that when people reach out to their local, they know the help that they're getting is legitimate and it's been vetted. Right. From a, a broader resilience perspective, when we look at what makes resilience work, the most important factor across the board, and this has actually been studied, for why people are happy is social connection. So the, the importance of social connectivity cannot be overstated. And I think that locals play a huge role in, in providing that environment where people can get together socially, fraternally, talk, be, you know, not necessarily do firefighter stuff, but they can get together, go to a ball game, whatever it may be. So I think the most important aspect is social connection. Locals play a huge part in making sure that that connection can happen. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's just one other way when we look at the different factors that create resilience that, that the local can play that, um, those positive interactions. You know, and, and in my experience as a local leader, you know, um, often run into this attitude sometimes that, you know, you, you think or, or you know that maybe something's going on and whether you're, you're in union leadership or, or you're just a, you know, a member, you know, at a station, but you have an inkling that something's going on, something's not right with somebody, or you know that they're, you know, something's, something's wrong. Uh, and, and I've often heard this to say, well, it's none of my business. You know, I'm not getting, uh, it's, you know, none of my business, you know, as a union leader, what do you, I, 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 I take a different approach to that. I think it really is our business and, and to actually, you know, if, if we, if we can't help each other, which is also holding each other accountable, then, then we're failing each other. What, what are you, what's your take on that? Is it, is it our business? Uh, yeah, I did definitely is our business. I, I mean, and I understand the attitude that it's not, and I don't, my view is people who say that don't really believe it's not their business. They just, that's their excuse to avoid having that conversation because it's uncomfortable and, I'm afraid I'm going to make them mad or they're going to tell me something where I have to jam them up or whatever the case is. Yeah. But that's where if, if you have put these systems in place, you don't have to jam anybody up. Like yeah. that should be, that's just the excuse we use to avoid this whole conversation. I don't want to get anybody in trouble, but left left to go unchecked or unintervened or at least try, there is going to be trouble yeah. eventually. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's what these things lead to. Yeah. I mean, we've we've been putting these problems to bed for over 200 years, and it hasn't gotten us very far. Yeah. Uh, we've made a lot more progress by calling it out when we see it and having those conversations and knowing what the resources are. And, hey, here's peer support. You know, we look at Indiana. We worked hard uh, a couple of years ago to get confidentiality laws passed to protect our peer supporters in those conversations where you can say, look, this isn't this isn't my jam. I don't know how all this works, but I know up here, you can talk to them privately. It's just going to be between you two and they can help figure out what you need to do next. If anything, that's going to be up to you. And I think by having those conversations and empowering the person we're talking to, because this is a big part in this, people don't need to be told you need to get treatment. You need to get help. People need to hear these are the changes that I've noticed, specifically changes in mood, behavior, thinking, and life events. Those are the four areas we look at. Say specifically what changes you've noticed and how it's impacting them and the people around them. And say, you know, if you want to get help for that, it's starting clearly starting to affect your your work. 
I've heard you talk about how it's affecting your home life. Let's take care of that. Let's get you with peer support. And they can have that conversation if you decide to do nothing. That's between you two. But I want to make sure that we foster that relationship so that we can get this before it gets out of control. Yeah. And and sometimes, uh, you know, uh, you may not be necessarily welcomed when you bring that conversation up. But, but that should not necessarily... Um, prevent you from readdressing that at a, at a different time. Sometimes it takes a couple of times to say, yeah. you know, I, I want to have a conversation with you. You know, I'm still concerned about you. And, you know, you can be pushed back. And I think that that's our nature. Nah, I'm good. You know, I don't need, I'm, there's nothing wrong here. You know, I'm, I'm good. Don't worry about me. Mm -hmm. um, and it might take a couple of times. Yeah, to, that's fair. To reach back. So um, before we move on, you brought up a really uh, good point that uh, you were the driving force to uh, create some uh, new Indiana law, and, and uh, you know the PFFUI came alongside of you to help uh, at the legislature and with the, the assistance of uh, the author of the bill, Senator Kreider, who has really invested a lot as a former law enforcement officer and, and, and uh, ally for public safety in the legislature. He, he came along to usher this in, and I just want to thank you for being part of that space because that's so important. Uh, and and keeping us abreast of the things that we need uh, to try to work on in, in the General Assembly um, in in the space of, of uh, public safety, you know, wellness and support. So thank uh, you. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And if I could be so bold as to thank both the PFFUI and Senator Kreider, because uh, I couldn't have gotten anywhere without that support in the committee hearings and without Senator Kreider, who happens also to be my state senator, which is, is really cool <laughs> Yeah, because um, he's such a, a a gentleman and, and really does care about what we're all going through. Uh, so thanks to you all as well. Yeah. And uh, that was the best testimony that I could ever give after you. Um, yeah. It's a good <laughs> bill. What he said, we're on board. We encourage your passage. <laughs> so we have talked about having the conversation with our colleagues that we think might be having a issue. What are some warning signs that we can look at uh, with our colleagues that they might be going through something to where they might need some help? Across the board, anger. Um, and this is whether somebody is suffering from PTSD, anxiety, depression, bipolar, really across the board. The first and greatest red flag warning sign we will see in one of our members is sudden unexplained anger. Pay attention to that. So when you consider what's happening in the body and mind of somebody who's starting to struggle, particularly a first responder. We're used to being in charge and having the solutions and being in control. It's our nature. When I start to feel vulnerable, when I'm scared, when I'm afraid, my life is starting to spiral out of control. I'm not comfortable letting those emotions take control over me. But if I get angry, if I push back, that at least in my mind puts me back in charge. Anger gets things done. Um, that fight or flight response. We don't run, we don't freeze, we fight. That's what we're conditioned to do from day one of the academy is we are met with a challenge, you fight your way through it. We don't quit. Mm -hmm. And I, that's part of the reason we see that anger manifest itself. So be very aware if you have a coworker who's suddenly getting angry, picking fights, getting in arguments, confrontations, escalating calls. We know that happens. And um, so be aware if somebody who's usually pretty level-headed starts to escalate calls, in the confrontations, that's a, a warning sign. Another warning sign is uh, somebody who starts to isolate. Maybe they don't come down, you know, for group activities or have the group activities. People listen to this are going to think we're, you know, doing. You are yoga. That, that, that is true. Yeah, we break out the incense, and uh, yeah. Um, but somebody who you know maybe used to come train or or doesn't join you for meals anymore, or used to watch TV, watch movies, and now they don't come to the TV room. That's a pretty ominous sign that things are starting, that person is starting to struggle. I talked about how important that social connectivity is for somebody being resilient. So it, it plays a factor there. It's also one of the three things we see happen when somebody becomes suicidal is the first, they have a, a feeling that they're a burden on other people. And they also, the second big part is that they feel like they've lost their connection with everything that, that used to be important to them. Uh, so that's why isolation is a warning sign for uh, possible suicidal thoughts. Uh, so I would say if you had to take away two things, sudden unexplained anger and somebody who starts to isolate are two really big warning signs that, that one of our people is starting to struggle. And, um, you know, and everybody has a bad day now and again, but this would be sort of a repeated um, uh, departure from regular behavior, right? I 
Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because it, there is, I guess, the additional element that you see these behaviors and they're starting to affect work or home life. That's always when we talk about any type of disordered behavior, that's that's what makes it disordered, so to speak, is that, like you said, we all sometimes feel depressed. Or we all grieve. These are good things, right? Your emotions aren't bad. They're, they're good. We have them for a reason. But when those emotions are so strong or so chronic that they start to impact home life or work life, that's when we say, yeah, we need to talk about getting a professional assessment for this person. Yeah. From the department perspective, does it matter um, who initiates that conversation? Uh, does it have to be an officer or, or should it not be an officer? Or how, how do you view that? It's so a, a really awesome question because I know that that can be one of the reasons somebody might not ask. And I think the closer to the person, the better. Um, so I think at the company level, this is one of our responsibilities as crew members is to, to know the baseline of each other and to recognize when things are going wrong. So whether it's a fellow backstepper or a company officer, absolutely fine to ask about it. I would say if you're a battalion chief, maybe you don't know that person as well, obviously, as the other people in the company. It's okay to have a conversation with their officer and say, look, I've, I've noticed these changes in this firefighter. I don't know if you've noticed them. If you want to have a conversation or if you want me to, um, but I, I think keeping it as close to that person as possible increases the likelihood that they're going to get help because those people know them the best. Yeah. Um, and there should be, by virtue of working together and being the closest, that, that, that there's a level of comfort there. Yeah, Eddie absolutely. Sort of kind of goes hand in hand. Yeah. Maybe not always the case. Maybe it's a, a sub or a, a newer person or, you know, somebody's not been on the job that long, you know, that, that you know, you maybe have to think a little bit about, you know, who who should be the person. Yeah. So, and, and I think if you create a climate where people trust the systems you have in place, it's one of the fortunate things we have in Indianapolis, and I know other agencies as well, have had members where uh, one agency in particular I can think of had a member with an alcohol problem, and the chief himself went to the person. It meant a lot to that person that the chief took the time to talk to him and could see, I'm not getting ready to get cut loose. The chief is actually talking to me and, and letting me know that my life is important, my career is important, my family's important. How do we get you better? You're not, we don't want you off. We want you working. So how do we get you in the best condition that you can do that? Mm -hmm. um, so even at that level, at the highest levels of your agency, that conversation can be had. Um, but it requires, I think, the legwork and, and the hard work of developing that trust uh, with the administration, but it can certainly be done. Yeah. And, and you know, drawing from some experience, excuse me, um, you know, as a local leader, um, we've had situations where there needed to be discipline because a, an, an incident occurred, uh, but that maybe through that incident, it was discovered that there is a, you know, there's a need there by that member that needs help. And, and part of what <clears throat> we've always tried to, to do in those situations when, when possible is to say, okay, the discipline piece isn't like the priority. The priority is the member and mm -hmm. getting the member into help or treatment or the place that can sort of start to address the issue. You can always come back to the discipline piece later. That yeah. that should not. And sometimes, you know, and we've had to call that out and say, let's let's just pause on this. Like you're you're gonna get your opportunity. There there is a consequence mm -hmm. for things. You know, the, there is a time for that. But what the, what we need to deal with first is that member because um, the hope is that you can overcome, you know, this, this incident, um, but also prolong a good, healthy life. And, and that, I think that that is also very impactful to the member's family. You know, sometimes in these crises, it's, it's not just the member. We, we sometimes have to, uh, not forget about the family, yeah. you know, because they're going through these issues as well. So, yeah, I think it's interesting to point out w one thing too, uh, that I just mentioned is that um, we have newer generation of firefighters, um, EMS folks coming in, and um, we've had some discussion about, you know, uh, the newer generation maybe isn't as uh, comfortable in sharing about, you know, their stuff that goes on outside of work, you know, just basic mm -hmm. stuff that, you know, you talk about your family and talk about what's going on, what you did on your days off. Is that something that you're looking at? Is that something that is a that is a real thing that, that we have to sort of pay attention to? 
Yeah, I think so. I mean, and I, I think always being aware of generational differences. We know, I think it's by 2025, 70% of the fire service will be millennials, which ha- just from a communication perspective, younger generations, I'm a Gen Xer and we communicate much differently than millennials and younger generations. And that can cause within your firehouse strife on some level that, you know, we always, com- I mean, ever, I'm sure every older generation has always complained about the next generation and, and how right. they're just not quite getting it. Right. 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 Um, it'll be the end of, of time. This will be it. That the, this is the generation. You just don't get it. Yeah. Um, so I think having that, that record, that understanding that just because they don't communicate the, the way that I do, doesn't mean they don't communicate and it doesn't mean they have to communicate the way that I do. I think respecting that is important. And we've talked about resilience. I think one of the areas we can focus on is not necessarily what those differences are, but what all brings us together. Why do we all want to do this job? Is it service? Like focusing on the commonalities between the generations, I think, can be useful to developing those relationships. But I think also accepting that from maybe Generation X to to Baby Boomers and on back, like this was a job that you took and that's what you did and you were going to do it till the wheels fell off and then you got your pension and uh, through the good times and bad times, it's kind of like a marriage on this job. You just stick with it, right, to the to the bitter end sometimes. Um, and I think one of the big generational differences is younger generations don't view this job that same way. If it's not satisfying, if it's not fulfilling, they're not afraid to move on from this job. Sure. Um, and I think there's an accountability maybe for administrations and, and labor groups that we have to be on the ball. We have to pay attention to what we're offering our members and their families. And are we doing what we're supposed to do? If we want to retain this workforce, we have to compete with that. Yeah. It's um, really insightful. Yeah. Uh, as we, I, I think we want to talk a little bit about um, some of the treatment options. And, um, you know, there's a variety of things in it. And what I've noticed over the last few years is that there are um, mental health um specialties or addiction specialties that are that are really marketing towards public safety uh, folks that um, it's not like you know you said this is we've had problems for 200 years this is nothing new but it, it, it all of a sudden seems to be more um, like common I guess that that you know for military folks for people to be reaching out to say we have a special program for public safety and military blah 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 um, and where can a member go? And I know that we're working on some things, you and I and, and, and Tim and others, about creating some resource available that, that um, kind of lists, and you mentioned vetting uh, clinicians um, that we hope to see come out uh, and available to members after the first of the year. But, but can you just speak generally about you know, what some of the treatment options are and, and, uh, out there? And it's, it's pretty broad topic. Yeah, yeah, and there are all different all different layers, and I, I think a big part of it depends on the severity of the problem and how much it's impacting your life. Finances are important. Your ability to be away from home is important. So all these things play a role in deciding what kind of treatment you want. I think kind of the most basic is just your standard outpatient treatment, and that's similar to going to your doctor for a hurt back. You would make an appointment with a social worker, a psychologist to go once a week, once every two weeks to talk about your stress or your anger or whatever it may be. Um, a lot more of those are covered by insurance now because of parity laws in the insurance um, marketplace. So that that's kind of one option where I don't know how much help I even need. Maybe I don't need any help at all. So I, I can go talk to the social worker to get that assessment and figure out, can I do this or do I need to take things up to the next level? Could that be achieved through like a your department's EAP yeah. employee assistance program if they have that. Yep. Which is a which is a benefit that's provided. Yeah. Yeah. And that's part of, you know, under an FPA, like everyone should have an employee assistance program. And even if you don't have a lot of trust in your EAP, some folks have bad experiences. Sometimes firefighters are also their own worst enemy. And it's not the clinician, it's a problem. It's a difficult firefighter who's the problem and then they come out of that appointment because the clinician told them things they didn't necessarily want to hear and then they badmouth how bad the EAP is to everybody when the EAP is not the problem, the firefighter is the problem. Sure. As a union leader, I'm sure you've never experienced such things, but right. um, but uh, not to put you on the spot, no. but um, so an EAP could be a great place to start for that and they can do those screenings and assessments and, and a good EAP will say, you're describing PTSD, we are not equipped to help you with PTSD. But these are some resources that can, and they can help you with that referral. 
uh, because there are some trauma specialists who can do some particular treatments for that. Uh, but that outpatient level is kind of where I would start with most people. You can go for, to an intensive outpatient program from there. Uh, intensive outpatient programming is several hours a day, either in the morning or the evening, like for three to four hours at a time, three to four days a week. So it's a pretty big time commitment. Unfortunately for us, you can only miss so many of those appointments before you're thrown out of an intensive outpatient program because they really want a lot of continuity of care. Sure. Uh, so if you're still on shift, inevitably with a rotating shift schedule, you're going to miss too many of those appointments to stay in an intensive outpatient program. And unless your department's partnering with you really like as a healthcare issue. Yes. It would. Um, and allowing for participation at leave time. Yes. Um, to participate in that and then come back to work. And that's a great point. And that's one of the things that I encourage agencies to be willing to talk about is maybe you can only take vacation in 24-hour blocks. You know what? Can we carve out an exception where you can take vacation in three-hour blocks if it's for a verified job-related mental health problem or some, something along those lines where people can go to those IOPs, provide some kind of verification that that's where they're going? Yeah. That can go a long way to getting your people better and saving, if you want to get down to dollars and cents, saving your municipalities a lot of money. Um, uh, another option is if somebody's suspended at the time, that could be a good opportunity if you know you're going to be off for 30 days while your license is suspended. Mm -hmm. Can I get into an intensive outpatient program and, and really get to work on that? So there's another opportunity that, that somebody can seize upon there. The next level up from that is partial hospitalization where you would go to treatment during the day and then basically you go home at night or you live on campus at the hospital and apartments. Um, but it's a, an all day, every day type of, of treatment. It's more residential in nature, but you get to go home at the end of the day. Are those generally programs for like substance abuse and addiction? Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're really centered around the, the addiction model. Um, and then the, the highest level we have is uh, residential treatment. And that's just, you know, when we talk about a 28 day program that used to be kind of the standard for addiction. We encourage all of our people, if they're going to do a residential program, to, to find a dual diagnosis facility. That means that they can treat both mental health and addiction issues at the same time. The facilities that we refer people to, so for some facilities, your primary diagnosis has to be addiction. They'll treat both, but your primary has to be addiction. There can be some tricks to getting people into those programs, but the, the easiest way is to go to a program like the IFS Center of Excellence where it doesn't matter what your primary diagnosis is, they can take you. And it is a dual diagnosis. Absolutely. Facility. Yeah. So if you have PTSD and a cocaine addiction that's been getting you through your days or a heroin addiction, they can treat both of those at the same time. Um, so and I think on average at, at the Center of Excellence, I think right now the average stays right around 40 days. Um, so it, it is a commitment of time. There's never a real convenient time to do that. And our, our people have to be honest. Because I, I hear a lot, well, I can't be away from my kids for that long. You know, and, and in reality, if you're dead or you're in prison, your kids are going to be without you much longer. Right. Um, so if you're ready to make that change, and this is another area where we can encourage our administrators, depending on sick policy and how all that works, people can run up against it trying to be gone for 45 days with sick policies and all that. If people can borrow vacation time, trade times, things like that, so we can make sure that our people can get treatment and, and come back healthy is, you know, so valuable. So if, if there are prohibitions within your agency that keep people from getting that type of long care help, um, finding ways to address that, I think, benefits everybody. Yeah. Um, and, and those long care programs, by my experience, um, and there could be some variations, are qualifiable, qualified FMLA mm -hmm. um, diagnosis for for personal health care that that could preserve your position yes that's you know? that's absolutely right yeah yeah and and to that end i'm a i'm a huge fan of the center of excellence uh, obviously it was built for us by us um and only we can go there only iff members retired members can can go to those facilities however i will also say on some level and i i use this terminology not disparagingly because i'm talking about myself here but on some level a drunk's a drunk mm-hmm and there's nothing necessarily all that special about us when it comes to some of our problems. I think sometimes we blow some smoke up ourselves about how unique we are. Don't let resources and saying that, well, we don't have a culturally competent clinician in my area, don't let that be the barrier to getting help. Um, 
there are a lot of clinicians out there who haven't been through cultural competence classes and do a, a fantastic job. Do I prefer it? Absolutely. Would I s- tell someone don't get help because you don't have that type of resource? Absolutely not. Like on some level, the diagnosis is the same, um, but that cultural competence helps. I just, I hate to see people really get hung up on that sometimes yeah. because I think they do that to their own detriment. Don't let that thing be the, the barrier. <laughs> yeah, right? absolutely. To, you know, to, to getting there. Yeah. And then, and if you do get that care, particularly residential, an insight that I would give people, they go away for 45 days, whatever it may be, they get their treatment, they've had complete focus care on them for over a month and everything is great, right? You're coming out of treatment, you've been sober, you've got all this under control and now suddenly the schedule isn't centered around you. Like you have your own life with all the stuff that was making you want to drink in the first place, bam, you're right back in it. Aftercare is so important, and I've seen so many firefighters fall on their faces coming out of treatment because they don't have aftercare set up with a clinician, social worker, psychologist, so that they can continue to visit to make sure that they're still doing the work. That's also where a recovery coach like myself or or Tim Gallagher, again, I know he's had the recovery coach training as well. That's where we help our members with accountability. Do you have meetings? Do you have a social worker? Are Are you doing your adult children of alcoholics classes like Show me what you're doing. That accountability is really important long-term to make sure that people stay well. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I I have seen it time and again where people get out of treatment and think everything's great, and it is for a short time before they fall right back into all the problems. So aftercare is every bit as important as as taking that initial step to getting residential treatment. That's a really good point. And, uh, you know, we I mentioned... um, providing some resources, and, and this is a good time to reiterate that, and, and Eric's going to help us with that. We're going to sort of put this uh, public-facing, you know, for our members to, to access. So after the first of the year on our webpage, uh, we want to be able to create some resource where members can reference, you know, what are vetted programs, what are vetted clinicians, uh, what are the steps, you know, sort of talk about in writing and, and on, on, the, on the page what you just discussed in, in terms of steps or where to go or or what to do. And, and then, you know, give, uh, make sure that we're putting the information out about how somebody can reach out to, to, you know, um, have an assessment done or, or talk about resources with, with, uh, care professionals too. Yeah. And if I could add one thing to that, um, if you are getting treatment now and you're really happy with your clinician, let your peer team know that. We need to know what resources we can trust, and there's no better endorsement than a firefighter or EMT or dispatcher who says, I went to this clinician and they were great. This is what they helped me with. That is a way you can really give back to your your brothers and sisters, and now we can put that feather in our cap to refer other people to. So if you're getting treatment, please let us know who you're seeing. That is a great point, because so often it's human nature to say, well, we're going to note who's bad. Yeah. (laughs) And and we sort of fail to to note who's good. Yeah, yeah I'd share that. Anything, what What else do we need to talk about? Uh, there's so much, and this is, I mean, it's been a pleasure to have you here. Yeah, it's been awesome talking about it. Yeah, no, Brandon, I just want to thank you for your time today, and uh, people can uh, look on the PFFUI website after the first of the year for these newly vetted sources about how they can get help. Um, and just want to thank you for your time today. Yeah, thank you guys. I really appreciate having the forum to talk about it. Thanks, and we look forward to, uh, you know, seeing you around and, and help at some conferences. And, and, you know, one of the ideas we're looking at is, uh, you know, at our PFFUI programming, much like the IFF does, um, having some recovery meetings. Uh, wow. You know, so that's something new that we uh, may be introducing in 2024. Excellent. Thank you for listening to the PFFUI podcast. Follow us on social media by searching the Professional Firefighters Union of Indiana. For more information about news and upcoming events, visit www.pffui.com. Until next time, this is PFFUI Communications Director Eric Schoeb. Stay safe.